a very warm welcome to all of you. I know that many of you are familiar with mitochondrial dysfunction and your children may have had testing already or various treatments. So my goal today is to give you whatever knowledge I can that can help you with either the diagnostic testing process or um, the treatment process. Um, before we jump in, I can tell you a little bit about my own background. I'm a pediatric neurologist. I did my training at Harvard Medical School and University of California, San Francisco. Um, and before coming to San Diego, I was on the faculty at Columbia University where I directed their autism clinic. And um, part of my research while I was there, a big focus of it was mitochondrial dysfunction and autism, mainly using brain imaging as the technique of um, investigation. I moved here last year and I have a practice now in Del Mar and I'll be starting a practice at Children's Hospital too. I don't know if I mentioned oh, no. that to you. Yeah, so Ooh. plans are in the process to get that going. Okay, cool. um, and um, also I work with a company called Mito Medical. It was uh, founded by the mother of one of my patients and because of my area of research she brought me on and I've been the scientific advisor for them. And she's really passionate. Um, she has a 10 year old son who has mitochondrial dysfunction and has been through treatment for many years. She's very passionate about this area and so education for parents is a big mission of the company. So we have about an hour together and I've organized the seminar according to these topics. The first, uh, we'll look at what causes autism. Then what is mitochondrial dysfunction and how does it relate to autism? How is mitochondrial dysfunction diagnosed? How is it treated and what changes are possible with treatment? I start with what causes autism. Now this is obviously a very important question and a very high proportion of the research being done now in autism is aimed at answering this question. And there are a lot of different factors that can lead to autism. I think a useful way to categorize them is as genetic factors and as environmental or external factors. And so far, over 100 different genes have been identified that either alone or in combination with other genetic and environmental factors can lead to autism. And now more and more research is also looking at external factors like infection, toxins, and other types of environmental exposure especially in fetal life or early childhood, and how these might be causative factors for autism. Now, even though we know an enormous amount about the different genetic and environmental factors that can contribute to autism, the fact is that for any individual child, we usually don't have a definitive answer. And it's actually very important to continue thinking about the causes, even if you know, the child's initial diagnosis was many, many years ago to keep thinking about and talking about it because we're learning more and more about what those causes might be. And the area of research looking at mitochondrial dysfunction is, in my view, one of the most important for both clinicians and parents to understand. And that's because mitochondrial dysfunction is a potentially treatable cause, and we'll talk more about that in detail. Mitochondrial dysfunction looks to be a factor in the majority of children with autism, whereas a lot of the other causes that have been identified seem to be very rare. And finally, mitochondrial dysfunction may be a final common pathway. Now what does that mean? It means that many of the other potential causes of autism, some that are well proven, some that are suspected and still being researched, such as a range of genetic factors, toxins, infectious and inflammatory processes, vitamin and mineral deficiencies, immune dysregulation, and drugs may ultimately lead to autism by harming the function of mitochondria. And because mitochondria in the brain are impaired, the symptoms of autism arise. Now, the impact that the various genetic and environmental factors have on mitochondria may not be the only way that they impact the brain, but it's likely to be a very important one.